Right, hello and um, welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you from San Diego as usual. And today I'm joined by Jeremy Miner, who is literally just down the road in Scottsdale, Arizona. How are you doing, Jeremy? Hey, John, Mr. Golden himself. I'm, you know, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, we're just hanging out. As, as you can see, we're both wearing, you know, short sleeve polos in the dead of the winter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the benefit of having your offices out here in Arizona and, and where you're at in California. So, hey, pleasure to be on your show. And let's see how I can help your your listeners uh, yeah. sell more of their products and services. Yeah. And Jeremy, oh, sales oh, trainer, oh. founder and chairman, author, podcast host, um, chairman of Seventh Level, a global sales training company. And your unique brand of sales training pioneers the use of behavioral science and human psychology, which uh, um, I think is absolutely fascinating. I think there's so many things to talk about, but um, maybe we just start off with you have this methodology called NEPQ. Could you just give me a kind of brief outline of what that's about and how it differs from other sales methodologies? As um, you may not know from my background, though, uh, I ran a company for for six or seven years it was spin selling it was neil rackham sales methodology one of the oldest ones around so i'm really interested to hear what's different between yours and other methodologies yeah so uh so i'll, I'll kind of probably would be easiest a lot of people ask me like events you know virtual events or live events like what's the difference between nepq traditional selling consultative selling like spin selling and i think it's easiest to break it down into like three different departments. Uh, my, my background is behavioral science, human psychology. That's what I went to, to school for. And as you know, you know, that's the study. Really, it boils down, they don't say it, but it's the study of the brain and how human beings make decisions and how and why a person is persuaded to do something or not do something. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important. Like if you're listening to us right now, you know, if you're driving down the road, don't you don't have to write this down, try to remember it in your mind, don't wreck. But if you're sitting there and you've got a pen and a people piece of paper, write this down because there are three forms, according to behavioral science, there are three forms of communication, three. Okay. Now there's some offshoots of this, but these are the three main forms. Once you understand the differences in persuasion and where you are now, like in your current sales ability compared yeah. to where you could be, as you know, everything can change for you financially and you get to help a lot more of your prospects solve their problems, get what they want. So the first mode of communication, okay, is era one type of sales, ERA, era one type of sales. That's more known, I'll give you a, a, a picture in your mind, more as like boiler room selling, okay? You think right. boiler room selling, right? You think you watch Wolf on Wall Street, like, hey, I've got a great opportunity for you. And then we we talk about the features and the benefits of, of what we do and how we have the best. And then we, we push them and we talk down about our competitors and we tell them why they need to buy and we got to talk to the manager to get a promotion and we explain why they need to go with us. And it's just like, I, I could see that you've seen that show. It's just like if you tell your spouse that they really, really need to do something for you and then you push them to do it. Well, what do they typically do back? They push yeah. back, right? It's human. Sure. You've met my wife, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this is going to be fun. So that's just human behavior one-on-one. -on -one. Let me give you a few examples of this, okay? And usually when I say this, people are like, what? No, I've been told, I read this book that said this. And I'm like, well, yeah, that book was written in 1965. Like we're in a different era. <laughs> you, you know, humans buying decisions are a little bit differently than they were so long ago. So presenting, you know, here's the least persuasive way to sell. I'm going to give you four or five different things. Presenting, okay? We've all been taught. We have to have a great presentation. We have to wow them with our, our, our slide deck and show them our corporate headquarters. And we've got a triple A rating with the Better Business Bureau. And we've received 17 customer service awards. And we've got the best this and the best that, which by the way, doesn't every single salesperson that's ever tried to sell you something say they have the best product or service, right? Of course, like, of course. Like I'm gonna ask you, John, like how many salespeople that have tried to sell you as you say, yeah, you know, our, our product is fifth best in the market. <laughs> no, like nobody does that, yeah. right? Yeah, I, that's pretty good. It's not the best, but it's okay. It'll do, it'll work. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, nobody says like, hey, I've got the best, you know, nobody says, oh yeah, it, it, it's okay. Like everybody says they have the best, okay? Just like my wife, you know, excuse the language, but she makes me watch Bachelor on Monday nights. Okay, no, you know, to TMI. And every time the host comes on there, 
and, and I was saying this earlier, they come on, they say, what do they say every year? What, you know, welcome to the show. It's gonna be the most dramatic show in the history of The Bachelor, the most. And you're like, wait, you said that the last 22 years. I'm not, I'm not understanding what's going on. So when we say things like that, like we have the best this, we have the best that, psychologically, just so you, what everybody knows, what goes on in your prospect mind is they actually trust you less especially if you talk down about your competition because they're used to every salesperson saying that to them. So according to the data, it's not very persuasive if your presentation is more than 10% of your entire sales process, okay? Mm -hmm. Most salespeople, it's about 50% of their sales process. That's a problem. Now, here's another way, least persuasive way. This is an error one, telling your story. Okay, we've all been talking. You got to tell everybody your story, like how great it is. I hate to tell you, Nobody cares about your story when you are selling one-to-one. -one. Whose story do they care about the most? Their They're story, wrong. right? That's what they care about. Yep. What about this? And I and I, I see this. I still see this even in even in B two B sales, like B two you know business to consumer B two B. I even see this. Yep. People talk about, oh yeah, I've got to give those guys my pitch. Like my pitch went great. I'm like, get rid of the pitch. Like selling, pitching is not selling. Pitching is what somebody does in Tijuana that's trying to sell you this $1 trinket when you're walking down the side of the road. Like that's pitching. Like you are not, a, like stop pitching. Like we even have shirts for our clients that say hashtag ditch the pitch, okay? Like if you watch Shark Tank, if you ever watch that yep. show, mm -hmm. you know, the entrepreneurs come out there, they're all enthusiastic and excited. Watch the body language of Barbara, Mr. Wonderful, uh, Mark Cuban, you know, Damon John, watch their body language. They come out and they pitch. It's like, oh my gosh, right? And here's the big one. This is still air one, assuming yep. the sale. Okay, according to the data, very low on the persuasion poll. And that's where the term, you know, sales as a numbers game comes from because of the way we communicate is causing it to be a numbers game, especially, which I think a lot of your audience is probably in a more of a B2B complex selling environment that requires multiple calls and touches. Okay, now that's just the first form. Okay, now let's talk about this. And just, and just to your point there, Jeremy, then they wonder why so many, after a first initial call or presentation, they wonder why people go dark. Right. And they blame the prospect. Oh, they, you know, they weren't ready. They probably don't have the money. Oh, they, they had some fear, you know. Well, you triggered that by the way you approach them, right? Now, I, that's a very good point. Now, second mode of communication, okay, that's era two type of sales behavioral science calls more consultative. Okay. That's what you just talked to me about. Okay. We're more persuasive when we attempt to have a discussion. Okay. Like you said, came out in the eighties with a book, you know, there was other books, spin selling, Neil Rackham, the professor, where they taught you needed to ask logical based questions and sell to the needs of the client. Now, what's the potential downfall of only selling to the needs of the client? The problem is, is that most of your prospects don't really know what they need, especially when you first start talking to them. Okay, let me give you an example, because when I say this, people are like, no, I, my prospects know what I need. I'm only gonna sell to what they need. I'm like, okay, I guess you can, but you're losing a lot of sales that these you know, top earners are making. So I'll give you an example of this. Let's say that uh, you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh my gosh, my head hurts so bad. I have this splitting headache. You know, I need to go to urgent care and I need to get some medicine. Um, you know, my copay is going to be $100. So, you know, that's my budget and that's what I need. And you walk into the doctor and the doctor doesn't say anything to you. And you say, doctor, I need some XYZ medication. I've got a splitting headache. And the doctor just writes out the prescription and gives it to you. Well, the doctor really didn't help you much because you might not know of what you actually needed. You thought you knew what you needed, but let's say you come into urgent care and the doctor asks you, some different questions to find out what the symptoms are and how long it's been going on and what it's preventing you from being able to do and, and how it's making you feel and other questions. And then he suggests based on his diagnosis that you might need a CAT scan. You're starting to wonder by his questions, you're viewing him as the expert, these questions are seeding doubt in your mind that you might need something a lot more than what you thought you needed, right? You do the CAT scan. It comes back, you have a tumor in your brain. And oh, by the way, if you don't have surgery in the next three months, you could die from the tumor. And oh, by the way, that's a $2 million surgery. Your insurance is only gonna cover 80% of it. You have to come out of pocket hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, now 
you know what you need and you're going to go out and find the budget, find the money, because when you first got there, you didn't know what you need. So you can never sell to the needs. You have to sell to what their real problems are are okay yeah and just uh, just on that jeremy too is that is one of the that is one of the prime areas where people fall down because they get so excited if you express a need that sounds like something i can solve and i dive on top of it and the problem there can be that yeah it may be a need it may be a problem maybe maybe not one that you really care to solve that you're even that invested in but now i've focused in on it hundred percent. So here's some, let me give you, I'll give you a few examples of a few consultative questions that your audience probably wants to never use. If you want to make a lot of money as a sales professional, okay. Cause these trigger sales resistance because they've been around since the stone ages of selling. So John, tell me uh, what's, what's keeping you awake at night? Never yeah, use the, that question. Yes. Yeah, the dog normally. Oh, yeah, exactly. Or can you tell me two problems that you're having the most or who besides you would be involved in this decision? Like you have to find that out, but you can't ask it that way. It's too surface level. Or what are you looking for in a solution, Sally? Okay. Those are just what we call very surface level, logical based questions. And when you only ask logical based questions, what type of answers is the prospect going to give you back? Logical based answers. Yeah. Right? And, and, and to your point, if you say, you know, what are your two, what are your two most pressing problems right now? Well, guess what? They're going to be the two that were most recently came across my desk. And again, may not be ones I need to solve, may not be ones care about, may not be the, the big issue, as you said earlier. Yeah. That 100%. Really need solving. Yeah, hundred percent. So when we stay in the surface level questions, that's, that's the problem with just staying in consultative selling. It's very surface level. Uh, and it, it just go into what the prospect said they needed. And we're trying to sell to that need. That's why I hate Bant as well. We can always go into that <laughs> a little bit later on because Bant's like backwards. But especially when you're trying to ask a prospect in the beginning, like, well, what's your budget? And you're like, you haven't even found out what the real problems are. Like you can't, it's just so, out, it's so whacked out. I, I hate Bant. But anyways, that's a whole nother Bant of mine. So that's the second mode. Your, okay. your, band, your band rant. I know the bat rat. So second mode, you're starting to play the numbers game with consultative selling because you're not bringing up much emotion by only asking logical based surface level questions. And as we know, human behavior says people make decisions based on emotion, not logic. The just brain studies show that. Now, third mode, this is where it gets more interesting, uh, is dialogue. Okay, that's air three type of sales. So we're the most persuasive when we allow others to persuade themselves. We call that yep. dialogue. When we ask, like you said, what are called neuro-emotional persuasion questions. That stands for NEPQ. Now the key here is what are those questions? Like what questions and techniques work with human behavior that get the prospect to want to engage with us, to actually want to open up to us and really go beyond the surface of what's going on, okay? Now, can we just, show up and say, hey, John, just, you know, go ahead and persuade yourself. Here's our wiring details and we're good. No, you have to learn those questions, but you also have to learn them in a step-by-step -step structure, okay, that gets your prospects and the right delivery, the right tonality, when to have verbal pauses, a lot of that, that gets your prospects to sell themselves rather than you try to do it. So that's NEPQ in a nutshell. Yeah. And just just coming back on that is, yeah, I mean, I say this to people all the time, like one of the first rules of communication is that people people uh, are persuaded by ideas that they come up with themselves over anything that you can say to them. So your you, part of your challenge is to seed their mind with enough of these uh, searching questions, pauses, discussions or whatever to allow them to come to those conclusions. And, yeah, you know, and I love what you said there about pauses, because, hey, if there's one thing that scares the heck out of a lot of salespeople, it's pauses, it's silence, and never giving people the opportunity to actually ruminate on what you just said to them. Yeah, well, it's so it's so true. Like if you look at some of the greatest moving speakers, okay, like a couple of people come to my mind, like Tony Robbins, okay, uh, President Obama was a great speaker, and when you watched him speak and Tony speak you'll notice that they'll say something or they'll ask a question and then they pause. And it allows the audience to think deeper about what they're saying. Now you'll have other people like other presidents and stuff. Every president has their weaknesses and strengths. So don't get me wrong, I'm not political. I'm just right down the middle, like everybody's crazy. I'm just, I don't know if anything makes sense these days. 
But, you know, every president has their strengths, weaknesses, but one of Obama's really good strengths was his verbal pausing. And people are like, wow, I never even, yeah, he does pause a lot when he asks something, but it got you to think deeper about what he was saying. It like spoke to your soul, right? You moved people, okay? That's something that has to be learned. Nobody is born with those skills. You're not born with advanced verbal pausing skills or advanced <laughs> questioning skills. Like when people say like, oh, he's a, she's a born salesperson. I'm like, nobody is born as a salesperson. Like, but that's like saying like, oh, somebody's born a professional golfer. No, you have to learn the skills. You have to learn the right techniques. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I've been studying sales for so many years. Well, that's great. You know, I've got a lot of books back here, here on sales too. Some of them I lost brain cells by reading. But yeah. just like Michael Jordan says all the time, he's like, look, you can take a thousand jump shots a day, but if your technique is off, if it's not the right technique, you're still not going to be good at basketball. So you have to learn the skills that actually work with today's sophisticated, cautious, skeptical buyers that get them to actually want to open up to you and tell you the truth of what's really going on. Yeah, and I, I love, I do love that when people say, "Oh, you're a born salesperson," or people or salespeople are born. I mean, the reality is about ninety percent of salespeople defaulted into the position in the first place, because a lot of them went and did degrees like marketing degrees in college, and then came out and realized there are five marketers for every three thousand or ten thousand salespeople, so they yeah. end up in sales. So, not equipping yourself, not teaching yourself, not being a lifelong learner. Uh, is just crazy, particularly as you may be in a in a in a job that you don't. Maybe you wanted to be a professional golfer, but you ended up as a salesperson. Well, yeah, you might and, as well practice sales as hard as you practice your yeah. golf. And it's so true because I mean, if you really think about it, like everybody in the world is in sales. Like I don't care what you do. Okay, even if you don't get paid a commission for a sale, you know some people call that like non-sale selling. You're still out there trying to persuade. You're trying to influence. You're trying to move others. Like if you're a business owner, you own a company, and you're, you know, because I've had business owners be like, well, hey, I, I, you know, I'm not in, I'm not in sales at all. I'm like, really, you're not in sales. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're trying to get your employees to follow your vision of where you want to take the company, what are you doing? You're trying to persuade. You're trying to influence. You're trying to move others. If you're an employee trying to get your boss to give you a pay raise, what are you doing? You're trying to influence, persuade. If you're an attorney, you know, trying to convince a judge your client's innocent, you're trying to persuade, you're trying to move others. Hell, we're talking about politics. If you're a politician and you're trying to get people to vote for you, you are in sales. You're a teacher, same thing. You're trying to get your kids to do their homework. You are always, all the time, constantly. And that's why you have to learn that skill set. You learn the right skill sets with that, you will never ever have any concerns about money ever again yeah only problem with the the politician one is normally it takes a couple of years before you can return the product for not uh, fulfilling not, not <laughs> living up to its promises um true, true. but it, it's it's interesting too uh, jim just want to ask you about you know that over the last while with COVID and everything um people talk a lot more nowadays about authenticity and trust and all of that how much how much has it has covid and just the, the collective global collective experience that we've been through how much has that impacted what people are looking for from their salespeople? well i i, I think it, it it's caused the world to become even more skeptical um, even more cautious about making the wrong buying decisions than they have ever done before. And, and here's one of the reasons why is because, you know, and it's probably getting better now, but let's say even a year ago, like the middle of the storm or whatever, uh, companies weren't planning out three years, five years, 10 years. They were planning out 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, right? I mean, because you don't know if you're yeah working in the office, what's going on? We don't know if we can even open the store. You know, we had car dealerships in Canada that were completely locked down. You like literally could not walk in. Nobody could, they could even sell cars, okay? So that's how they're thinking. So they're gonna be more cautious and more skeptical than they have ever done before. And I think, you know, we have a client, I just, I read this book by one of our clients, we have his name's uh, Brandon Kane. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a book called Hook Point. This guy's a huge marketer, does all like MTVs, uh, social media, you know, Rihanna's, Taylor Swift, big social media influence out in Hollywood. And he has this book called How to Stand Out in a Three Second World. Okay. And he talks about that there are over 3 billion, I want to say three, or I think, yeah, about 3 billion content creators every day that are trying to pull attention away from your prospects to what they're doing. 
you were even competing with 13 year old teenagers on TikTok right now. I mean, literally you are. Guess how many content creators there were even 20 years ago? Just take a wild guess. Oh, I don't know. It would be in the millions, would it? Yeah, it was a million. A million, yeah. Later, there's there's three thinking. billion, right? And, and here's why. It's because the reason why we're so skeptical is because in the information age we live in today, okay, with the power of the internet, especially social media, COVID has just added on to that. Your prospects are continually being sold to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, month after month. And when sometimes when I say that, events are like, I'm not being sold to all the time. And I'm like, really? Let me break it down for you. You wake up in the morning. What's the first thing you do? Get on your phone. You start going through your Facebook or IG and you see ads trying to sell you something. You walk into your kitchen you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. I'm going to get to the office. I need my coffee. You turn on the TV. You see commercials trying to sell you something. You get into your car to go to the office. You turn on the radio. You hear ads trying to sell you something. You drive down the road. You see billboards trying to sell you something. Your lunch break, you get back on social media and you notice your aunt is trying to pitch her newest, latest, greatest MLM. You are constantly being sold to all of the time. And because of that, human beings have built up a wall of resistance that anytime they feel that anyone is trying to sell them something, they emotionally tune out. Make sense? Oh, it totally makes sense. And that's why everything that you've talked about here, um, with uh, you know asking proper questions, really getting into uh, proper discussions with those pauses, allowing people to think, really going on a journey. And I think that's the thing is taking a real interest in going on a journey with with your prospect is because when I engage with the salesperson, I want to feel like they're genuinely interested and they have genuinely something to offer me that somebody else doesn't. Not their product per se, because a lot of products are commoditized but their experience, what they've done with other people, how how this has helped, how my my situation is similar to something else. But just give me something of value that makes me go, yes, you're the person I want to work with. Well, it's true. Like you, you said, you're not selling the product. You're not selling the product or your service. You're not selling the thing. You're selling the results of what that thing does for them. That's what you're selling. Like if you're an insurance agent, you're not selling them a uh, uh, you know, a financial, you know, an insurance policy that's uh, for a million dollars, you're selling the results of what that's going to do when one of them passes away and they're financially protected. You know, if you sell cybersecurity to banks, you're not just selling them the cybersecurity software, you're selling them the results of how that's going to protect their customers from fraud and losing money. That's what you're selling. If you're a real estate agent selling a home, you're not selling the home. You're selling them the results of what they wanted, maybe a safer neighborhood. That's what you're selling. So we have to, like you said, get out of that mindset of like, I've got the greatest product and service because when you, when you sell that way, like you said, you become commoditized with everybody else that sells the same thing. And then they try to compete with you on price. When the prospect feels that you are going to get them the results they want, they're willing to pay more for that over somebody that is just selling them a product and service that they're trying to negotiate down. So we have to get them to think results-based thinking over price or cost-based thinking. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And this, this, this has been fantastic, Jeremy. I mean, we could go on for hours, I think, but uh, <laughs> I could try and keep this within its uh, within our timeline. No um, all of Jeremy's information is gonna be below this, uh, uh, below this podcast, and particularly a link to the Facebook, uh, Facebook group, uh, where's yeah. the best place to go and find that information about Jeremy. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and your company. Yeah, and I was gonna and I was gonna say that because I, I apologize we didn't have time to go through like specific questions for different sales situations. So if they want to learn like different sales questions for different situations, just have them go to that Facebook group, the you know salesrevolution.group. And right when they join the group, um, they'll get uh, so there's like a two question survey, like you know, what do you sell? What are your price points? It just tracks the data for us in there. And right when they join they will get a message on Facebook Messenger from somebody on my team with a free training. They'll get tagged and send a message, free training. Uh, it's called the NEPQ 101 mini course, and it will give them some of those questions for like different specific sales situations, and they can have that free. We go live in that group about three or four times a week with different trainings, different Q&As, different subject matters. So they're welcome to join that if they want to learn more for sure. 
Yeah, and I'd highly encourage people to go to that. Um, you know, life is hard enough. Selling is hard enough. Like, go get some help. If they're going to offer you a free training, go take the free training. Invest in yourself. That's what I always say to people is you, you, you probably invest a lot of money in your hobbies and other stuff you do. How much time or effort and money do you invest in the thing that puts bread on your table? Well, it's true. Like, if you really think about, because we always say this, like, what's your biggest expense in life? And people are like, oh, my mortgage or taxes or my kids. I'm like, well, those are expensive. But the biggest expense in life is your lack of knowledge of not having the right sales skills for you to be able to get up to 300, 350,000, maybe even more in sales commissions because you just haven't acquired the right knowledge and skill sets to do that. So once you get the right knowledge, you make a lot more money and you have more money to invest in your hobbies. Yeah. And don't fall into the trap of, of saying, well, I, I've been doing this for 15 or 20 or 30 years. I know what I'm doing. Um, the fact is, you may, but you may have forgotten about a lot of things. Things may have changed. You may have gotten into bad habits. So I always encourage go back. I do. I do. I'm, I'm big into martial arts and sometimes I go to go to class and our, our master spends the whole time doing basic techniques that we've done thousands and thousands of times and you always get some way of tweaking it some way well, of making like it we better. always say like what has gotten you here mm -hmm. how is that going to get you here exactly you're going to stay at the yeah. same end. perfect thanks for having me on perfect John. All right, listen, thanks a lot, uh, Jeremy. Absolutely fantastic. As I said, all of Jeremy's information below this podcast. And I'll see you all again for another interview really soon. Thank you.